All right, I'm, I'm going to commit a pedagogical sin, which is to interrupt a very lively conversation. I, I hear a lot of good ideas kind of being kicked around. Um, before we get into this second session, um, I want to also just make a plug for the Facebook page for the University of Montana. We often put job opportunities, internship opportunities, things like that. Um, if you get an email from me or the grad school, you'll be tempted perhaps to delete it. Don't. At least open it and scan it. A lot of times those will be ad hoc job opportunities, especially in the last year I've been able to work with local businesses to um, forward job announcements directly to graduate students so that's not filtered. Um, so you definitely want to open an email that comes from me. Sometimes it might have some bad news, but most of the time it's going to be something interesting. Um, the Facebook page, if you like that and if you use Facebook, uh, if you're, you know, I know that's aging out, we're aging out of Facebook, but I'm still on it. Um, like the page and we'll do the same thing. Uh, and I want to really emphasize GPSA as well, that they'll sometimes be making announcements on behalf of the grad school or in conjunction with us. So make sure you open those emails. When a GPSA announcement comes, it's usually a graduate school networking event uh, or a job internship event or an opportunity for you to, um, you're pointing, you have a Facebook page too. Yep, yeah, GPS has a Facebook page, like it as well. Um, so without further ado, we are gonna move into the session and we're gonna pick up right where we left off about academic misconduct with Nathan Lindsay. Great, hello everyone, it's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Nathan Lindsay, I serve as the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. And one of the roles that I coordinate with that is the handling of uh, academic misconduct, cheating on campus. So I hope you had a good discussion about what you would do. Um, I imagine that you were doing it, handling it appropriately. I, I would share with you that uh, the answer to what, what you should do is found online. So if you Google on UM's website, student conduct code, the student conduct code uh, in that document, it's a 31 page document, is a pretty good section on the process for handling academic misconduct cases. We want you to know that we treat uh, academic misconduct very seriously and we strive with uh, all we can to uphold high academic standards. So if you do note uh, cheating or plagiarism, it is your responsibility to address it. And the process that I um, recommend for all of you is to talk with your supervisor, to bring it up uh, with the person that, that oversees you and to give them the details and then um, in the student conduct code are the step-by-step -step details. Basically, you would document the cheating or plagiarism or other academic misconduct that you saw and meet with the student along with your supervisor. I would not uh, meet with them uh, alone. Um, and in setting up that meeting, you'll have the, the chance to hear the student's perspective and uh, what what they bring to that conversation, and then depending on how things go from that, uh, the the consequences or sanctions can uh, go up the ladder from the department to the dean to the university. And we do uh, try to keep a record of all uh, academic misconduct in the university so that we don't have repeat offenders. We don't have people cheating in your class, in your class, in your class. Um, and as we uh, note that, we're able to provide or level heavier sanctions on those students so that we uphold our standards. Um, at the back of the student conduct code are a couple of um, templates for the memos that you should send to students. So if you look at the very end, there's a form um, that you would fill out in um, notifying the student and uh, asking them to come to a meeting. And we wanna hear their side, we wanna balance justice and mercy on these and make it a learning experience. Um, but um, at the end of the day, the um, sanction will be up to you and your supervisor. And that could be that they fail the assignment, that they uh, need to do it over again, that they fail the course if it's a, a major issue, or that they are suspended or expelled if it's uh, continued. Um, cheating or, or uh, kind of a, a larger issue. So with that, any questions? Please. Yeah. 
Um, I would meet with them individually uh, to hear their perspectives and, you know, give them the notice separately um, to see, hear uh, the different sides, you know. If someone is facilitating cheating, then they're responsible as well. So if they know that someone's looking on their paper and not doing anything about it, then they're they're culpable also. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Uh, great question. So in that situation, I would try to convey to the supervisor that this is a serious situation, that the vice provost has said it's a situ serious situation. Um, and if, if you say we, we need to address this and communicate that clearly, um, I, I would talk with the chair of the department or, or the dean's office because we can't just look the other way and turn a blind eye to this. So. It, it, I would try to get your supervisor on board so you're not going around them, but uh, try to have a frank conversation because um, that's not appropriate. I mean, they may have a different perspective on the consequence. They may say, well, let's let them do the paper over again, and that may be appropriate, but to say, you know, it's not a big issue, that's not, not good. Other questions? So again, student conduct code, uh, if you just Google that, it will walk you step by step uh, so you're doing that appropriately. And just one other thing, if I can mention for a couple minutes, um, so we have someone coming. Um, we just got out of a meeting with all the administrators, uh, the deans and cabinet level members on campus, and we discussed the retention and completion rates for the university. Just like, uh, uh, guess, what percentage of students graduate from UM? Who's, who start here of the undergraduate students? Yeah, 48 over here. It's almost, it's right around 50%. To me, that is a heartbreaking number. If you think about your students and you just go down the row, it's like every other one is graduating. What percentage of students are retained from the first year to the second year? <laughs> uh, luckily, it's higher than that. Uh, so 48 is over the six-year graduation rate. It's, uh, this last year it was 68%. So almost a third of students are not coming back for their sophomore year. Again, we're looking to increase that rate from 68 to 80%. Other, other institutions that are similar to UM, other peer institutions have retention rates in the high 70s, 80s. And we are working to improve advising, we're working to improve financial aid and a lot of other student support services. But I wanna to convey to you that you have a critical role in helping students feel like they matter at UM. If you think about your own education, there was probably a faculty member or a, or a TA or a graduate assistant that you really connected with. How many of you would say that was true in your undergraduate experience? So my challenge to you is to be that person, is to really, take ownership for the students in your classes and to help them feel like they matter, that you're in their corner and that you care about them. You truly can make the difference in helping them to get over the challenges that they have. Every student's gonna have challenges in their undergraduate experience, but if, if they feel like you're someone that they can talk to, that you care that they succeed academically and just personally, it will go a huge way. And I just charge you and, and beg you to be engaged in being that type of a instructor that is fully engaged and wants to help all of your students. It's, it's, what the, it's why we're in education. It's the worthwhile part of what we do. Yeah. Yeah, great question. I think uh, many faculty have kind of drawn the line in social media use with their students being appropriate um, and probably not doing too much one-on-one -on -one with individual students. I mean, you can have students for your office hours, but kind of outside the classroom. I think having group sessions with your students at the library or going out to lunch would be totally fine. You know, if you're inviting the whole class or a section of class, 
Um, I think some of our best faculty are making those connections where they invite people, you know, to other social activities or academic activities. So that would be great, great to do. Just a quick follow-up too. I, I'm kind of speaking out of turn. I don't want to speak on behalf of the college deans, but most of the college deans have programs too where they're encouraging faculty to take students out to lunch in a, in a program structured way. So if you're interested in that, reach out to your college dean, whoever that is, and say, is there a program in which I could be linked to a student in the major? Um, what they're finding is that one-on-one -on -one contact. And the university picks up the lunch tab. So this would be at the food zoo, and your meal would be free, and you'd be meeting with one or two or three students in your major. Um, so reach out to your deans and see if that's an option within the college. We're going to move along. I guess Alicia is running late. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Strongly discouraged. Uh, by policy and, and by rule. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, and, and some of this might have been covered in Alicia's Title IX presentation. She's, she's the missing piece here today. Uh, so let's, let's put a pin in that and see if she shows up at the back end of the panel, and you can ask that one directly to her. My understanding is that there's not a university-wide policy. Yeah, I think I think it's um, it, it's not a policy, but it is strongly discouraged because it's it's a conflict of interest. There's a power dynamic there that makes it inappropriate. So you want to wait till after the class has ended, or you, there's no more, you know, contact in terms of a, a power dynamic of student teacher. Well, speaking of power dynamics, um, I'm here to talk to you today about the Student Advocacy Resource Center. Um, my name is Jessica Petey, and I am the direct service coordinator at SARC. Um, I also provide counseling and advocacy services to the clients that we work with. Um, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with the Student Advocacy Resource Center, um, we typically provide free and confidential um, counseling and advocacy services to students, faculty, and staff who may have had experiences of sexual assault, relationship violence, discrimination, or harassment. So um, I think it sounds like all of you are aware of your role as mandated reporters to the Title IX office. If a student were to come forward to you and report something like relationship violence um, and or sexual assault, one of the really great things um, that you can do at that point is also talk to students about confidential resources that they have that are available to them if you're ever in that situation. And so we hope um, that this would be an opportunity for you all to mention the Student Advocacy Resource Center as one of those potential resources. So SARC provides a number of services that kind of fall underneath that uh, um, advocacy umbrella, one of which is called academic advocacy. So we know um, from research that People who have been victimized are often impacted educationally. And as, um, sorry, there's a fly. Um, as, um, the, um, sorry, Nathan? Nathan was just saying retention is a large um, issue at the University of Montana. And one of the ways um, that you can all be of assistance and assisting students in staying in, in enrolled in the university is by providing them with academic accommodations if you know that they may have been victimized in some way. And so, and one of the ways that um, you all might interact with SARC is through those academic advocacy services. So one thing that might happen to you, uh, more than likely, uh, during your time as, as graduate student TAs, is a student might um, disclose an instance of victimization to you, or you might hear from some of our advocates at SARC that are reaching out to um, request academic accommodations for students that, we're, that we might be working with. So in that case, um, in order to kind of help that student be successful academically, we're really hoping that all of you um, can meet us uh, as much as possible with the accommodations that we're requesting. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so a couple of other things that are helpful for all of you to be aware of. So we have on our website uh, a nice little letter slash overview form of all the services that we provide to students. Um, so these are all of our direct services. On, on our website, um, if you go under faculty resources, we have this letter available to all of you. You can print it off um, and give this to a student if a student were to come forward to you. It can also be something that you can utilize. Um, we cer certainly work with graduate students um, and, and other faculty and staff on campus who may be in need of our services. It can also be a nice um, reminder for you as you're talking with a student 
what all those those options are for that student. We also have on our website um, under that faculty resources tab a syllabus statement that you can all include in your in your syllabus. Um, just talking about SARC, the services that we provide, and um, when someone might want to um, seek out SARC services. So that is also available to you on our website. You can include that in your syllabus. One of the other things that SARC does that isn't widely known on campus is that in addition to providing direct services, we also do a lot of preventative education and outreach programming. Um, the goal of that being to hopefully uh, improve the, the culture and climate on campus around certain issues like sexual assault, relationship violence, et cetera. Um, so one of the other opportunities um, that is available to all of you is to take advantage of some of our preventative education programming. Um, we have a program called Don't Cancel That Class. So for those of you that are teaching um, this semester or, or in future semesters, if you are ever in need of um, filling a class period, perhaps where you might be absent, or maybe you're going to a conference, or maybe perhaps the content of your course is relevant to some of the trainings that we provide, you can get in touch um, with our office, and we would be happy to have a guest speaker come and present on a particular topic in your class. So on our website, we have a list of those trainings that are part of that Don't Cancel That Class program. If you're looking for something that is maybe not listed on the website, but feels like it might be um, under our purview, you can also reach out to us and discuss what those specific needs might be. Okay, any questions? Um, I really wanna advocate for, especially if you have control of your own section of a class, and I know not all grad students do, but the trainings are amazing. I do one in almost every class every semester, and they really just are fantastic. Great energy they bring into your classroom, and they just open that extra window to the students to give them a sense that they have support. So take take SARC up on that. Got it. Um, Is that better? Yeah, that's a lot better. We're way less important than SARC, so if you want to tune this out, that's fine. Uh, we can help you in maybe two ways. The first way, one of the ways you might be exploited in the next year or five uh, is that you might be asked to look at some undergraduate writing and grade it or comment on it. I don't know if anyone told you you're being exploited. Maybe that was in the earlier session. Um, if that happens, if you're in charge of looking at some undergraduate writing, uh, it might happen that you encounter some grammatical errors or formatting errors. It might happen more than once. Uh, and if you encounter those types of errors, you might be tempted, maybe very subtly tempted, to m fix them or mark them with a red pen of some kind. Uh, don't do that. Please don't do that. It's like if you're trying to get your kid, I don't know if you have kids, if you're trying to get your kid uh, to clean their room and you're telling them you should clean your room while you're vacuuming the room for the kid. Uh, it's, it's exhausting. It's important to have a no cell phone policy also if you're teaching your own section. Uh, <laughs> it's exhausting to, to be doing the vacuuming and the kid is not going to learn to clean their room, right? There's a lot of research. If you only remember one thing from my talk, don't fix your students' uh, grammatical mistakes or formatting mistakes. Don't waste that energy. Instead, come see us uh, and talk to us about uh, more effective interventions that we can do with you uh, for, a, for an individual student who's really struggling with certain aspects of their writing, for the whole class, which is more likely there's probably trends that we could help you address, uh, either in your feedback or by coming into the class and doing some kind of workshop uh, maybe we can sit down with you and the lead instructor for the course and, and put together something that might help. Um, when we do this with TAs and or with instructors, usually the instructors and the TAs report that the undergraduate writing gets better, less of those um, vacuumable offenses. So please reach out to us. Can you bring up our website? There's the link right there. Yep, perfect. 
if you go to that website and uh, in the About Us section, you can contact uh, myself, Jake Hansen, or Gretchen McCaffrey, or Shireen Grogan. Those are the three sort of admin people in the Writing Center. Uh, and we'd be happy to work with you on that. The other thing uh, that we might be able to help you with is your own writing. I don't know if anyone told you, you're, you will likely have to do some writing during your time in grad school. Uh, and probably if you got this far, you've managed to do some, some pretty effective writing um, or trick people into thinking that, you've done, that you are able to effectively write. A lot of people are nodding at that trick. Uh, you know, probably you don't need us. Most of you are probably going to be able to get through your graduate programs without our help. Um, we do help, if you're really struggling, if you get into the, the sort of learning curve, usually accelerates pretty sharply for people. And uh, if you find yourself struggling or falling behind, getting negative feedback from your instructors, uh, we're happy to help you. If on the other hand, uh, you know, you're sort of sailing through and feel like you're not being pushed very much, basically we can, if they're being too nice, we can be mean. And if they're being too mean, we can be nice. If they're being uh, enigmatic, we can maybe be a little more clear. So, so I think um, we can give you more and different kinds of feedback sometimes. More individualized feedback really is the thing, just the time scale. We have more time than the faculty do to help you with your writing. Uh, the best way we can help you with your writing is through one-on-one -on -one appointments. Most of our appointments are half-hour sessions. For graduate students working on bigger things, we sometimes will book out an hour, and you can contact us to set those up. Uh, some graduate students will come sort of sporadically and work with whichever tutor is available. That's very effective often. Sometimes graduate students will find a tutor that they like to work with and set up recurring appointments, especially on big you know, thesis or dissertation things, uh, and, and we're very happy to do that as well. We also can help with, um, I don't know if any of you will be writing your own grants, we help with that. Uh, cover letters once you hopefully someday can get a job. Uh, and or other sorts of people who are writing scholarship application essays, we often help with that as well. So any kind of writing that you're doing, uh, we've probably seen it before and would be happy to try to help you um, navigate the challenge. We also do graduate writing workshops. So on the graduate student resources tab, the dates for this fall aren't up yet, but they will be in the next few weeks. Most of those workshops will be more applicable when you're working on that big final project of thesis or dissertation, but there are some that uh, might be useful earlier, maybe in the fall of your first year, or certainly in the first spring. Uh, we also do, Gretchen McCaffrey runs a wonderfully effective um, dissertation or thesis boot camp, jumpstart boot camp, and she wants you to be a little ways into your project, and then it's a, a short week of sort of every day, m most of the morning um, sessions. The people who do it usually rave about it and find it really effective. Uh, I don't know if you know this pain and angst yet, but often people hit that challenge of that big final project and sort of lose their minds and their souls and she can help with those things. Um, I think that's everything I was supposed to say. Please reach out. We're so happy to help you. Yeah. Yeah. That will happen. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a few, I don't want to get too in the weeds, but I would say the biggest thing is to look for trends, mistakes uh, that are happening more than, you know, more than three times in the paper, and pick maybe one or two of those to try to address individually with, with that student. You know, marking it, if they don't know the mistake, marking it usually won't have them go, oh, now I get it, and now I'll avoid it forever. Um, a really slick trick is to find mistakes like that across the whole class. Say, oh, this is a thing that comes up for many of you, and then do seven minutes in class or get your uh, professor to either do it or, or let you do it and show them a couple of those things. And then once you've explained it a little more thoroughly, and we can help with how to, how to decode some of that stuff and explain it, uh, then you can hold the bar a little higher on those types of mistakes. Hey, remember this thing we talked about? But trying to catch them all, uh, there's no way. 
I mean, that'll exhaust you. You'll spend two hours rewriting the paper for them, and they'll be totally overwhelmed or apathetic, and the, the, they won't then avoid those mistakes in the future. We all learned the grammatical things we know through years and years of reading and writing a bunch, not through like a, you know, one paper one time, somebody saying red ink on, on the misplaced comma. We don't have to talk about that more. Well, but I'm we gonna use that as a segue. So Jake does workshops um, out of the uh, writing center, the graduate. He also will help you with your stand-up comedy, by the way. If any of you are working on stand-up comedy, this is your guy. But um, he runs workshops out of the, the writing center, and we try to coordinate with the grad school. We invest some money in them to kind of do specific outreach. And so that would be an example of a kind of topic. So if we hear that on the survey forums, that several of you are like, you know, we'd like a, a, a workshop focused on engaging student writing, we'll run that, right? In other words, we'll turn around and we'll organize that kind of workshop. So plug for that and a plug for reading your email because you'll be getting stuff from me about that and from Jake and the Writing Center when they get the workshop series up and running. You'll get that um, in your emails. Come to the workshops. I can say this, I just looked at the numbers like last week. Um, there's a, a sharp um, increase in the number of graduate students using the services. They're fantastic and you can see it ripple through departments. One student goes and does the uh, Jumpstart uh, boot camp, and the next time they offer it, 10 students from that department do it. So do it. Go early, go often. They're great people. You'll get a lot of work. I do want to also make a plug for GradCon. The uh, submissions will be at the end of this uh, fall semester, beginning of the winter, but you can work with uh, the Writing Public Speaking Center both on your abstract submission and on your paper and on your presentation. Um, there will be specific workshops for grad students to kind of prepare for that. Um, for some of you, that may be your first public presentation. Others, you may be pros and maybe don't need it. But they're able to engage with you at a lot of different levels. Everybody, everybody needs it, even yeah. if you're pros, you need yeah. it. Of course. Professional so, athletes get one-on-one -on -one coaching. Sorry. Just yeah, saying. yeah. So um, I thank Jake for coming in, and but we did have Lucy slip back in um, to, to talk a little bit about Title IX, which is a very, very, very important topic. It came up in the first session about uh, questions of mandatory reporting, who's a reporter, et cetera. So she's going to kind of pick up that uh, mantle for the next couple of minutes. I am very brief. I am very succinct. That's what <laughs> Thank you. So um, I am stepping in for our Equal Opportunity um, Director, Alicia Aaron. She's awesome, and I encourage you to meet her. As sometimes happens, um, things come up where we are all pulled and have to focus on the crisis at hand. So I'm, I'm happy to step in. I was happy to be sort of between meetings. Um, I would encourage you all to look at, again, this, this applies to you in your role as TAs, as um, employees of the institution, as well as your role as students. Um, and your rights and responsibilities. So we have a discrimination, harassment, retaliation policy um, that sets the standards. There was a question in the earlier session about um, LGBTIQ. I can proudly say that um, it's not in protection for gender um, expression, sexual orientation, um, and gender identity is not yet in state law, but we have it at this institution and we've had it for a long time. I think we were the first campus um, to adopt that as a policy. So there are protections under our policies um, and the um, protected classes are identified in that policy. Um, if somebody, if you have a concern, so the Office of Equal Opportunity serves as a resource. Again, if you have a question about your own situation or about somebody else's situation, it serves as a resource. Alicia has staff in her office. She's also a, a lawyer and trained and an expert in this area, but she does not represent the institution. When she's doing an investigation, if somebody files a complaint, she's neutral and impartial. That office is neutral and impartial to find out what happened um, with the goal in mind of stopping anything that's ongoing, any ongoing discrimination, preventing it from happening again, and then um, um, remedying any harm that might have been done. So connecting with resources. And also their interim measures sometimes if somebody reports and we just need to figure out something right now. Um, that's what Alicia will coordinate and she works very closely. So there was a question about mandatory reporting. I know I'm, I speak really fast anyway, so if there are questions, ask me. But the, I, I just, if you don't remember anything else, it's a great resource, and look. Um, mandatory reporting. In the university's policy, employees, and now you're all employees, 
are required to report any information they have about student sexual misconduct. Um, and I would encourage you, if you have any other concerns, um, call the Equal Opportunity Office, call Alicia, send an email. Um, the confidential reporting, I think you have a panel with Drew. Okay, she'll talk a lot about confidential reporting. Curry Health Center, everything at Curry Health Center is confidential. It doesn't go to the police, it doesn't go to the Equal Opportunity Office. That's a great resource as well if somebody needs resources. Um, but report information that you have about prohibited discrimination to the Equal Opportunity Office. Are there questions about that? Uh huh. It's a great question. Does UM have established alternative resolution channels, conflict resolution channels? Um, in the procedures to the discrimination policy, if it comes, you know, sort of within the jurisdiction of discrimination, um, there can be an informal resolution process or a formal. Obviously, b maybe it's not obvious, but both, um, if there are two parties or the, the people that are involved in a dispute or a question about that, both have to agree to an informal resolution process. Um, other for employment, um, it, there is a conflict resolution process through human resource services if it, if it doesn't have to do with discrimination. Other questions? Great, you have so much information to retain, but again, they're great resources, a great team of people, and I can tell you, again, you can probably see everybody works closely together. If you call the wrong office, or it's not, it wouldn't be the wrong office, somebody will then refer you to the, to the right resource. Thanks again. So let's thank this uh, group of panelists. They need to move on with their days. You guys.